Man, welcome to Monday night. Man, it's been an awesome day today for the circuit riders. It's been great. I've got them down here in the studio with uh, my crowd, Andrew Boyer. I've got a crowd of one right now at the camera. Um, we were just talking about some good food earlier. But no, seriously, this is an awesome night. And we had, the, we had a day together today as circuit riders at um, Edison Park. And we got in this, I don't know how many were there. How many do you think were there? I, and do you think there were 200 there I, more? Maybe 2.30. Yeah, it seemed like 2.30. I didn't count. So somebody else would need to do it. But we got in this, God showed up. And, you know, we've been in the pandemic mode, you know, and just we haven't been able to gather. And everybody was there. And we got on our knees in this circle. And number one, it was so unbelievable to be together. And number two, it was so unbelievable to see each other's faces. And then God brought us together. And the very first thing he brought us together to do was to pray and to deal with in our hearts and to cry out to God on the subject of racism. And I, I got to go down and say for me personally, that was the most special. We had a lot of special moments in the history of the circuit riders. That would definitely be one of the hallmark top two or three, four that I've been part of. And so we're in Black History Month. And tonight's message is walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile. Walk a mile in my shoes and understanding injustice. And we want to uh, dig into this today, but I just want to give a backdrop of what's happening already in the community. There was, you could feel in that place of prayer that there was, there was something that broke through. And it was deep. It's deeper than words. I can't just say, oh, we had a breakthrough in this or a breakthrough in that. There is something deep and the spirit of God is moving and he's moving in the circuit riders. And I, I, I believe one of the aspects of it, and I want to start tonight by talking a little bit about the history of the circuit riders, the original circuit rider, just for a few minutes. That's not the main part. But Francis Asbury, as we all know, those of us that are circuit riders here is, you know, he's this incredible figure that suffered, always had horrific health, and he went across America, and he was, he was the captain of the circuit riders in America, and he had this deep commitment to being an abolitionist, and so to be a circuit rider, to be a modern-day circuit rider, is to carry the same heart and the same convictions as the original circuit riders, and the original circuit riders were abolitionists. And Francis Asbury had a number of things that he said about this. Number one, Francis Asbury always allowed his heart to be affected by the injustice of slavery. It was more than a mental assent. And I want to say, there's no more that I know about it. I'm not for it. I'm against it. But he allowed his heart. When you let your heart get invaded on a subject, and that's where he was at. He was, he was in the fight in his motivation and in his heart. Number two, um, I want to read a quote from him. And he wrote, there are many things that are painful to me, but cannot yet be removed, especially slave keeping and its attendant circumstances. The Lord will certainly hear the cries of the oppressed, naked, starving. Oh my God, think on this land. Amen. Um, he wrote later, very rainy night with thunder and lightning. I'm grieved to see slavery and the manner of keeping these poor people. So to be a circuit rider is to carry this heart and this action of the original uh, circuit riders. On June 8th, 1783, he lamented. He said, um, I went to, uh, well, he's talking about going somewhere. It's a lot in the quote. I'm just trying to summarize it. And he saw the cruelty that was happening to a slave. And he couldn't, know, he couldn't stay there anymore. He was so undone. He was weeping before God. It's like this grief came on his soul. And that's why I'm saying his heart was deeply, number one, Francis Asbury allowed his heart to be deeply affected by that injustice. He would not turn a blind eye. Number two, Francis Asbury prayed for, it to, for slavery to completely end. And prayer is the greatest form of activism in Christianity. When we're crying out to God, we're getting his compassion, we're getting his passion, and Francis Asbury was carrying that. Number three, 
Number three, Francis Asbury saw a connection between experiencing revival and the need to stand against injustice. In other words, revival separate from facing and dealing with injustice wasn't true revival. So the Methodist abolitionist movement was inspired by this, these early Quakers and this early group of people that said, no, we are here for the liberation of slaves. We're here for revival, but they're connected. And so racism was connected to the original circuit riders. Number four, Francis Asbury confronted the church that was tolerant of the evil of slavery. He brought leadership to the growing movement of circuit riders and Methodism by promoting and teaching scriptural teaching about the ending of the evil of slavery. He spoke to some select friends, one of his quotes, about slave keeping, but they could not bear it. This I know, God will plead the cause of the oppressed, though it gives offense to say so here. That was in June 4th, 1780. Francis Asbury confronts, I want to say it again, in this Black History Month, we're learning right out of the gun, right out of the moment of the beginning of the series, that our history as circuit riders is out of the well of the abolitionists. Our history, you cannot say, I am a circuit rider, but I don't have a heart and I don't have an action towards the issue of the oppressed or racism in its many different forms. Number five, Francis Asbury appealed to governmental leaders for intervention and change. In his efforts to reform the culture, Asbury saw the necessity to shape the laws of the land in order to relieve the suffering of the slaves and to prevent expansion of the slave trade and ultimately ban the practice altogether. This isn't, though, if the whole message was about Asbury, we'd go into I'm summarizing these points. Number six, Francis Asbury, the circuit writer, was passionate and pragmatic. When the boldest efforts like all-out emancipation proved to be ahead of their time, Asbury was still relentlessly pragmatic. Pragmatic means, people have asked me about the circuit riders. They say, what are the circuit riders? I said, we're the practitioners of the gospel. We may not have all the theories. We may not have all the prophetic swirl moments and all the details and all this and all that. It's kind of how I say it. But I'll tell you what, we put it to practice. Do you want to gather in a stadium? Then let's go rent a stadium. Do you want to gather in a field? Then let's stop talking about it and get to a field. Do you want to go to a high school? Do you want to go to a college? This isn't the time. And a circuit rider is not someone that just is dreaming it up, but a circuit rider is a practitioner. Asbury is our model. And there's so much to say he about this man. In 1924, um, there... It just, there, oh man, I wish I could read all of this. We will give it out to the circuit riders to study. But man, it just burns in me. Number seven, Francis Asbury never stopped preaching the gospel. He was a revivalist. He was an abolitionist. But there is no conflict in him between the two. And there shouldn't be for us either. He never stopped laboring for the salvation of souls. He never stopped fighting to eradicate the injustice of it in his day of slavery. He loved the slave, the slaveholder, and the atrocity of slavery didn't cripple the heart of Francis Asbury. He carried an internal flame of the only true answer to injustice in the earth, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the answer then, and he's the answer today. Francis Asbury, I want to just challenge us right now in prayer. Those of us, some of us are going to listen to this message. Am I called to be a circuit rider? Are you burning for what Francis Asbury was burning? It's the call of the circuit rider in this hour. So walk a mile is the primer for this month that we're saturating ourselves in this discussion. A primer is that book you read before, you know, the real, the real textbook is coming. This is the warm-up. And so we will not have the ability to cover all of the, the, the subject of this in one night. But my assignment is the assignment of compassion. And that is our starting place tonight, is 
how now, as a circuit rider, what is my first step in the subject of racism? What is my first step? Number one, and I want to make this, uh, I want to grab my phone here. I, I, I made some notes on this. Um, number one, I want, to, I want to start with a scripture and we're going, to, we're going to kind of build from there. Matthew 9, and we're in verse 36. I want to start at verse 35. Listen to this. It's incredible. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And he, he was healing. Hear this. He was healing every disease and sickness. In another, another rendering of this, it said that everywhere he went, sickness and the diseased would follow him. Jesus had pain following him everywhere he went. He came to the earth to deal with the sins of the world. And while he was on the earth, he was healing the sick. The Bible tells us. The verse 36, it says, when he saw the crowds, when he saw the crowds, he sees He sees the crowds, and that's where we're introduced into this beautiful word. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And this is where we miss this. I'm not saying you've missed it. Maybe you've been ahead of me on this. Maybe you've been down the road on this. But this is where it's easy to miss this as we look at this text. Because when we say, this is where we go into the beauty of the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You cannot escape what just happened in verse 36. What he's saying is few are those with compassion. Few are those who see how white the fields are with harvest. Few are those who see, few are are those who are willing to engage their heart fully in the pain of those around them and bring the solution, Jesus Christ. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. That is incredible. And I want to unpack this in in a minute. And then, of course, the great prayer of Jesus. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. We know that we are in a moment where we're praying, God, would you ekbalo the labors? But what God is looking for is he's looking for his burning ones that are carrying compassion. And I want to unveil this. When we're talking about racism, we're going to get into more of the subjects of it. There's so much going around. There's, there's new terminology that we cannot be intimidated by. We can't run from critical race theory and go, oh, I I can't run from cultural Marxism. I can't run from white privilege. I can't run from white guilt. I can't can't bury my head in the sand, so to speak, and not engage because I'm standing on the truth of Scripture, and Scripture is going to show me how I am to respond in this hour. It's the truth of Christianity. It's the truth of who Christ is that's going to give us a way forward. And so we can't, number one, be intimidated by this subject because that's exactly what Satan wants. Satan wants to divide us into further camps on this subject. And and Jesus already brought us together at the cross because number one point of this is sin. Racism is a sin. And the depravity of man's heart has created the sin of racism. Let me say it again. The simplicity of the scriptures is that racism is clearly a sin. And as Christians, there's sometimes where sins will say, oh man, I really am against pornography or I'm against trafficking of women. But we, what, what God is challenging a generation is, would you pick up the torch and see the subject of racism and carry it with you to the four corners of the earth. It's time for the freedom of Jesus Christ to touch the hearts and see that at the foot of the cross, there are no races, there are no colors that are separated. We're all brought together, all of our sins forgiven, all of us united together as God's people. And it is through Christ that we're not left with an unending 
tension or an unending division, but in Christ through the cross, we see that Jesus's compassion of carrying the sins of man brings us an answer. And how do we get there? Number one, how do I get to a place of compassion? Because in order for us to have a passion and it responds to issues of race, we first have to have his heart. In other words, before we all run out the door in action, we need his heart. Number one, it's time, sugar writers, to listen to people's stories. It's time to listen. I'm not saying we haven't been. I'm not saying I haven't been. I love to. I know you love to. But there is a greater focus in this hour of listening to the stories of others. You know, it's funny for me, I, as a, as a pops around here, I've just, I've lived a little longer and it's, it's amazing how hard a time I've had in getting people that are older to listen to young people's stories. Man, I would look high and dry like, man, would you just get coffee with this young guy? Would you just get breakfast? Would you just, and every single time, I mean this, I'm choosing these words. 95% of the time, I ask the young person, hey, did they hear your story about your, you know, how hard it was growing up? Your dad was in prison. Your mom, da, 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 you know, left to the curb. These horrific stories. There's thousands of variations of them. No, the guy or the gal talked the entire time. Listening is a difficult thing or there would be more of it. And active listening is when we're leaning forward and we're saying, I want to hear what's happened to you. Tell me more. How did you feel? What happened next? And it's not then when we're done listening as if the act of listening was the finishing task. No, compassion means to suffer with. It means now that you've told me this story, I did not know this had happened to you and I am moved. What must I do? What can I do? And you're united in friendship and you're bonded together. You're not just, the one sharing isn't just left feeling ashamed or a sense of like, did I say something wrong? Um, a lot of times, if you're a black person, you share your story with a white person and then you're left feeling, did, did I do something wrong by sharing my real story? Circuit writers, we must end this immediately. We must end this now. The day of that is behind us and the new day is now. We will not listen without compassion and action in our hearts and minds. We're not here for political stunts. We're not here for just activism for the sake of activism, doing right for popularity. We're here to burn with the heart of Jesus Christ for our brothers and our sisters that have come from harm's way. We must listen. And in those stories is the birthplace of compassion. This message, walk in the shoes of another for a mile. Because when you put the shoes on of someone and you listen to their story, it's every single time our whole world changes. Everything about us changes. Everything you thought changes. It changes. You're like, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. And it can be made. Sometimes people have a massive story. Some people have a smaller version of the story. Some people have great detail. Some of us do, can't tell their story. They're sobbing. They're in pain. They, they've never told anyone. And it's that active listening. It's not that passive listening passive listener, where is your heart for Jesus? I ask you boldly. You think listening without compassion, we cannot let those who have suffered the, 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 the harm, the harm of racism, racism to be unheard. Well, how long must I listen? That's the wrong question. How long do I get to listen? Because in the stories, you will only find yourself more emboldened, like Francis Asbury, to say, then let there be empowerment, equal opportunities. Let me lift up my brother. Let me lift up my sister. Let me lift up their voice. Let me lift them up. Let me, let me serve them. Let me be like Jesus in Philippians 2, who who said, no, I, I'm going to come to the low place. 
I want to lift you up. I want to encourage you. I want to build you up. I want to take you places that you've never been. I want to help. I want to see you advance. It's that compassionate listening. That's the game changer. Number two, I pray tonight. When we listen, you have to lay aside your desires. Because in compassion, I know this from my own life. I do not compare the suffering of 38 years of Lyme's disease with Christy to racism. I'm not a fool. They are not even close subjects, but I can connect in this subject of suffering. And all I can say on suffering is that for Christy, when we started out and she was sick and the first one year of marriage, I remember I took her to this class because it said it was a help group for people that had her disease. And I went to the group. It was on a Friday night. We went. I thought I would encourage her to hear, you know, other stories. I thought there'd be overcoming stories, victory stories or pain stories. And I went to the meeting and I went in there and everyone was telling their stories of such severe sickness. I'm telling you, I remember it like yesterday, brain stuff. Oh my God, it was so intense. And I told Christy after 15 minutes, I looked her in the face and I said, get up. We're walking out of here. And I said, I never want to hear that again. Compassion is hard. God wanted me to stay to the very end, but I couldn't take it anymore. It was too much. And then the Lord in his grace allowed me to be immersed year after year in that drumbeat of the suffering and the pain of others until he fitted glasses for me to look at people in a different way through the love of Jesus Christ, that everyone has a story. That's why original design was birthed out of suffering because we found joy in hearing heaven say, you are not a normal person. You have a design from your king that is so beautiful. You are a masterpiece. It was never a ministry assignment or duty. It was the thrill of those with pain and suffering seeing how Jesus speaks about him because it's in compassion that we lay down our own desires and we pick up other people's. I never thought I would have to do this. I never thought I'd have to get involved. I never thought I'd be preaching this way. I never thought, I never thought, well, you, you give up your desire in compassion and you pick up. That's why Jesus was so rare. He had compassion. Why didn't everybody else see all the sick? They'd been there all along. Why didn't anyone, why did the modern shepherds of that day not see the oppressed? Why did Jesus only see them? Because he, Philippians 2, he laid aside his desires. When you come before the high priest Jesus, it says he is sympathetic to our sin. Not that he ever sinned, but he understands our struggle. He understands the black struggle. He understands what they have gone through. He understands it intensely and he has never looked away. Come on, my white brothers and sisters. We have no time for pride in this hour we have no time to worry about being accused of this or that or the other thing. But it is time for action. It is time for compassion and active listening and then moving forward in Jesus' merciful answer. The Bible holds the answer. It is the love of Jesus Christ that breaks every barrier. And if our black brothers and sisters would be empowered, how great the move of God would be to the ends of the earth. We have a missing chair and they're not sitting in it. And my white brothers and sisters, how long will we let that chair be empty before we fill it? My passion tonight, I'm sorry, it's intense on this subject. But I see that empty chair. And my favorite preachers that raised me were the preachers like when I was a kid and onward, when I began to listen, they were black preachers. Those were my favorite ones at Tacoma. Those are the ones I had all the tapes of. 
We're missing them in this generation. Where will they come from? My white brothers and my white sisters, will we not call forward the black voice? Will we not fight for the black voice in this generation? This has been a difficult journey to this message tonight. It has been through great prayer and travail. I thank you, Jesus. My last point. Oh, Jesus, be with us. You see, when we listen and we hear, and oh, that great thing called compassion comes forward. That's Jesus coming forward. It's Jesus who has compassion. And he comes and he leans in. We are healed. The healing begins when we're understood. It is not being understood that brings such pain. But as Jesus understands us, we obviously are healed in Christ Jesus. But when our brothers and sisters reach across and say, I want to know your story, we are healed because we're understood. There is healing in the blood of Jesus Christ for each other. We pray for each other. We pray for each other. And God begins to bring that balm, that salve on our eyes and our hearts, and we're healed. I can say that our wonderful Jesus had compassion. I want to bring this home for us. We're obviously in a moment in this hour This is about movement, isn't it? Jesus moving again. Where's the spirit moving? People always ask me about movements. Isn't it a funny question? A funny question to ask a man about movement. I find it always so silly, as if I know where the Holy Spirit is moving when he blows like a wind, and I'm trying to find him myself all day. How could I know what the next movement is? As if I was a scientist of movement, I'm barely able to walk and tie my own shoes and find where the Holy Spirit is in my day, let alone for you. But Jesus is always moving on injustice. And Jesus is always invading injustice with hands and feet of mercy with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's it's, it's that hour in our history to move. I want to bring this home, and I only say this, I don't want to cause discouragement. But I can only, I want to bring this home as real as I can. When you're in a room, and everyone's having, when my black brothers and my black sisters are in a room with their white brothers and sisters, and they, and we as white brothers and sisters think that, oh, they, they know everything we're talking about, but they are really left on the outside looking in. But they're not saying anything. They're not saying anything. It's almost as if they are invisible. Why are they invisible? We must end the echoes of the pain of the generations, of of the, the horrific pain that slavery truly caused. Some say to me, oh, why don't you get over the subject? Move on. How can I move on? There's still pain. And when there's still pain, Jesus is on the job. So I work for Jesus and he's on the job and he doesn't want them to be invisible anymore. He wants them to be a loud voice This pandemic has hit us. I have not. I'm choosing my words. Many of you know I have a horrific bummer because of this lung disease. Everything in this disease can be controlled through medication, but not the lungs.
You know, I have not had one person besides my family ask me about my lungs and how I live with this great COVID disease, always knocking and knowing that if it gets me, I won't come through. Someone to say, Brian, how do you live every day and not be afraid? Or are you afraid? How do you feel? No, I'm invisible. Praying for you. We cannot have trivial words. That's just religion. We must put ourselves in harm's way at the crosshairs of culture and not be trivial listeners or distant lovers. We must walk into the thick of this hour in history and say of the circuit riders, it was in that time that they became abolitionists. And everywhere they went, they went to the inner cities. We're going to the inner cities. How can we not? There's something to learn there. We must go to the historic black colleges. We already are. Why? We must learn. We must grow. And if we play the drum of heaven, of all the colors in Jesus' creation, the sound that will come forth will be a sound the earth has never heard and will be heard at the end of time, we're told. It's time that no one is invisible. It's time that no one is left in their suffering in silence. But we invade with questions and care and concern and solution. Tonight was a primer. Oh, it was a good primer, I suppose. There's so much more I wish I could say. But I am encouraged because the great man, Francis Asbury, as we began tonight and end, the great circuit writer, Francis Asbury, who was sick his whole life, frail health. He drank nail juice, which was the rusted nails he would put in a jar and he would drink the rusted water to help with his arthritis. That was his anti-inflammatory before Advil. And he rode on that horse and he burned. He burned for the gospel and for injustice. Wherever you are tonight in your houses, it's not going to do anybody any good to be stuck in white guilt and afraid. White guilt isn't going to get us there because guilt isn't part of the scriptures. Yes, we ask forgiveness. That's always, always part of the Christian life. We humble ourselves. That's the Christian life. But to stay paralyzed in guilt seems like Satan's behind that. Because how can we come together and become a family if one part of the family is paralyzed in guilt and afraid, my white brother and sister, do not be afraid. This is the hour of boldness and the hour to say it's okay that I didn't know that or I didn't know this. Be, it's okay that we're learning and growing as the nation is stirring. We cannot hold ourselves to the perfection of Jesus but we can say we want to learn and to be paralyzed and to be afraid is not the road home. The road home is to invade with a heart of compassion. Tell me your story. I want to listen. And when you're done, you don't need to give a great speech. If you've got one, bring it out. If you've got nothing, but I love you. I want to be friends. I want to get time together. I want to be together. Let's go eat. Let's go. We got to be a family. And that in the circuit riders, that we represent 40% minorities for sure, because that's the generation. 
and we don't have time to talk about all our other brothers and sisters, our Korean brothers and sisters, our Hispanic brothers and sisters, because today, this is Black History Month. And we've decided to stay within this beautiful theme in this hour. But do not think that it is not burning on God's heart every nation and every tribe. Oh, Jesus is magnificent. When you think of Jesus, the great one, isn't it amazing that he came to die for our sins, knowing all the junk that man has done, and he made the one way for us to be reconciled to him and reconciled to each other. Circuit riders, let's not be afraid any longer. Let's not just let a few get involved in this subject. It's time for the every and it's time for the all. And it's time for you and me. It's time now. I close with a dream and I was so blessed by this dream. I've shared it before, but it was so real to me. Dreams sometimes are more real than some dreams than others. And this one, I was in a restaurant and I was on the second floor of a beautiful restaurant and down below was where most people were seated. And I was up in the balcony, which only had rows of chairs just there looking over the balcony. And in the dream, I had the lung condition I had. I had, I had all the breathing issues, but I was a black man and I was, I was the same size. I'm 5'10". I might've been that in the dream. And down below, a white man was yelling racial slurs and racial painful words at me. And I realized in my great weakness of my sickness, I was in the dream as if I, I am in real life. I'm limited by illness. And I wanted to get up and I wanted to be brave and I wanted to say something, but all oh, these lungs in that dream were not allowing me the strength. I left the restaurant in the dream, that black man that I was. And I went outside and this mother came to me from the black community. And she came to me and she, she looked at me and I was crying because of the pain that was in that restaurant and the helplessness I felt. And it was the black woman. It was the mother who picked me up. She lifted me up. She lifted me up. And she said, Brian, I give you the boldness of the civil rights movement. It's yours. Take it. And I woke up. I find myself weaker today than I've ever been in my life with sickness. And yet the Bible says that it's in our imperfection and in our weakness that Christ is made the strongest. I believe we're in the hour now of that fulfillment of that dream. Could we dream in a young generation of finishing MLK's dream? Let's pray. Jesus, I just ask that you would move in my heart tonight. I don't know what everybody needs listening in, but as for me, I ask you for your mercy. I don't feel particularly strong tonight. I don't feel particularly able to jump tall buildings and run out and make all these amazing declarations. Jesus, I need your strength because in my flesh, there will be no difference made. Jesus, would you come as my friend and take over my life? I lay it down again. That you would have your day and your say. And that all my black brothers and sisters would say of me when I'm long gone, 
He carried Francis Asbury's heart. There's only one Francis Asbury. But B carried his heart. And I asked for my sugar rider brothers and sisters. The same would be said of them. That they would, in their days of old, look back at decades of radical ministry and say, their children would say, we looked, but we could not find the invisible black brothers and sisters like you told us. They're the heroes. Look what became of them. Finish that dream in Martin Luther King's heart that he might rest knowing that so many in this nation are picking up the completion of his assignment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you next week. Boy, it is a painful subject. I make no apologies for my tears that won't seem to stop. I look forward to next Monday night and the following Monday night as we continue this beautiful journey. I look forward to our staff times on Mondays. This month is going to be one of those months that we'll remember for a long time. And uh, it's going to be one of those beautiful times that we realized we were a family, but we became. Oh, what a family we became. So be encouraged and be strengthened and go in the peace of Jesus Christ. And may we find the hope of Christ for a generation and share it with everyone. Amen. We'll see you next Monday.